This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, and a special shout out to Essex County Community College. The students are here today watching at Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue deep inside the $1 trillion a year processed food industrial complex, we turn to look at how decades of food science have resulted in the cheapest, most abundant, most addictive, and most nutritionally inferior food in the world. And the vitamins and protein added back to this processed food? Well, you might be surprised to know where they come from. That's the focus of a new book by longtime food reporter Melanie Warner, author of Pandora's Lunchbox, How Processed Food Took Over the American Meal. Melanie, welcomes to Democracy Now! She's joining us from Denver, Colorado. Um, vitamins, vitamin-added food. You think you go to the grocery store and you want to get a little added punch, and you want to ensure that your kids, that your family has added vitamins. What's the problem with that? Yeah, well, hi, Amy. It's great to, great to be here. Uh, you know, one of the things with processed food that I found while doing this book is not only that it has uh, an abundance of the things that Michael was talking about, salt, sugar, fat, it's also what it's lacking, which, which it turns out is naturally occurring nutrition in many cases. So that's vitamins and minerals and fiber and things like antioxidants. So you take something like cereal, you know, you walk down the cereal aisle and you're bombarded with health messages. It's high in vitamin D, uh, good source of calcium, fiber, antioxidants. You see these things all over the package. And one of the things, one of the questions I asked myself when I was starting to work on this book, was why is it nearly impossible to find a box of cereal in the cereal aisle without uh, vitamins, added vitamins and minerals in the ingredient list? And it turns out because most cereal has very little inherent nutrition. Um, and this is in part because of processing. The processing of food is very intensive. It's very, um, it's very technical. And with, with cereal, it can be very damaging to naturally occurring nutrients, especially, especially vitamins and oftentimes fiber. So what manufacturers do is they add back in vitamins. So essentially, you see all these wonderful claims on the package. But essentially, and you look at the panel, and you're getting 35% and 40% of your recommended daily allowance of these, of these vitamins. But they're essentially added in like a, like a vitamin pill, which many people may be already taking in the morning. Um, and I was really surprised to learn where some of these vitamins come from. Um, I never really thought about it in much detail, as probably most people don't. But it turns out that they're, these vitamins are not coming from the foods that contain them. Like vitamin C does not come from an orange, and vitamin A does not come from a carrot. It's very far from that. Uh, they, they come from things that really aren't actually foods. Uh, vitamin D, for instance, was probably the most shocking. It comes from sheep grease. So actually, the, the grease that comes from sheep wool, you have giant barges and uh, container ships that go from Australia and New Zealand over to China, where most of, a lot of our vitamins are produced. About 50% of global vitamin production comes from China inside these huge factories. Uh, very industrial processes. A lot of vitamins are actually chemical uh, chemical processes, wait, and they're very technical I, and complex. A lot of people, if they're with someone, they're looking at them right now. Wait a second. So China gets all these shipments of sheep wool from Australia, and they're pulling the yes. sheep grease off of them to make vitamin D? Yeah, sheep grease is actually very useful for a lot of things. Uh, it, can be, it can be used... Um, to make a moisturizer and lip balm. It can be used for industrial purposes, for lubricants, uh, for engines and machines and things like that. But one of its uses is to, um, to could be converted through a number of chemical steps uh, and chemical processes to, to vitamin D, which is added to, um, to our food and used in, used in supplements. So, um, what yeah, about, I just want to... What about nylon, Melanie? What does nylon have to do with vitamins? Yeah. Yeah, it's one of it's one of these chemicals that goes in into the making of one of one of the B vitamins. Uh, it's it's many there are many food additives actually that are used in food, but actually also have industrial purposes uh, associated with them. One of my favorites is uh, a chemical called a food additive called azotiocarbidamide, and that's actually used quite extensively in in bread and bread uh, bread type products. And it's used as a dough conditioner and a manufacturing aid. Uh, and its main use outside of uh, the manufacturing of bread is for creating foamed plastic, so things like yoga mats. 
And I encountered some, some news articles from a number of years ago uh, where a tanker truck overturned on the Dan Ryan Expressway in Chicago carrying a, a Zodiac cabidamide. And city fire officials had to issue their highest hazmat alert and evacuate everyone up to a half mile downwind uh, because, of, because of this chemical spill. So you look at something like that and you wonder, is this something that we really want in our morning toast and our, uh, the bread that goes on our, on our turkey sandwiches? Uh, well, that's a very important question. Now, of course, the processed food industry, the gross sales are enormous, but uh, you may have redefined gross sales. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about some of the experiments the scientist Melanie Warner conducted. Talk a little about yeah. chicken tenders. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not much of a scientist, but a number of years ago, when I started covering the food industry, I became curious about expiration dates that are printed on packages. Pretty much you go into the supermarket and every package uh, in, in the store will have an expiration date on it. And I wondered, well, what will happen? What do these expiration dates mean and what will happen after this date has come and gone? Some of these, some of these dates are actually quite far out. They'll be six to nine months or, or even more. So I started collecting a number of food products and I, and I saved them in my office. And then I would open them after the expiration dates had passed, sometimes long after the expiration dates had passed because I had forgotten about them. And what I found out over time, I collected all kinds of products, um, cereal, cookies, uh, Pop-Tarts, um, fast, fast food meals, frozen dinners, I mean, you name it. I have all kinds of gross stuff in my office at this point. And what I found, there were a few exceptions, but what I found was that most of this food did not decompose or mold or go bad, even after long, long periods of time. I mean, I started this seven, seven eight years ago, and I still have uh, slices of cheese that are, that are perfectly orange. Um, From years cheese. and years and years ago. Years and years and years ago. And yeah. what keeps and their color and what keeps them looking yeah. completely preserved? There are a variety of reasons for this, depending on the product. Sometimes it's because of powerful chemical preservatives that are in it. Sometimes it's because of additives that lower the acidity of products um, so that no microorganisms can grow. And sometimes it's because food manufacturers are uh, very intentionally remove all the water from products. That's the case with Melanie, cereal right now, and cookies. Melanie, for our TV viewers, we're showing images of uh, guacamole of what in a store, yeah. presumably, right. you know, maybe even a Whole Foods type store, you know, a natural food yeah. store, and your own yeah. guacamole and the difference how long it's preserved. Yeah, I think this was an unusual tub of, of guacamole, and it had an unusual dose of food additives. Uh, my husband uh, came back from the store with it one day and it said, oh, they, they announced, made an announcement. They, they made it fresh over at the deli. So I thought, oh, this is great. And I looked at the ingredients, and there were some ingredients on there that I never, never even heard of. And I was spending a lot of time doing research on food additives. So I kind of I put it away. I stored it in the fridge. And I thought, well, I'll look into this later and see, see what these additives are. Um, and then an interesting thing happened about nine months later. I completely forgot about it in the back of the fridge. Um, my, my mom, who, who lives with us, um, she announced that she had tried some of, some of the guacamole. And I thought she was referring to a, a, a recent uh, purchase that I had made at a different store that we had bought for a party. But I thought, you know, I think a lot of that's, that's gone. And it turns out that she had tried the old guacamole, the nine-month-old stuff. Um, and I was horrified because she's an older person. She's in her early 80s. And foodborne illness in older people is no small thing. Um, so I was terrified that she was going to be horribly ill. Um, in fact, she Because the wasn't. guacamole she was, was how old? Nine months. It was nine <laughs> months old. Yeah. So, and, and she had eaten it because it had no mold on it. It didn't smell bad. It was a little bit, when I looked at it, it was a little bit discolored around the edges, you know? Um, so some people might have thought, oh, maybe I'm not going to eat it. But she looked at it and thought, oh, this is a nice guacamole. So, um, and in the end, thankfully, um, she'd only had a little bit and she was, she was totally fine. She had no, no effects whatsoever. Melanie, 15 seconds before we end part one of this discussion, what most surprised you? I think the, just the, the overall extent to which the technology and food science has merged with, with food production and the level of engineering uh, that, that goes in the level of technology and the level of processing that goes, into, that goes into our food. And also the extent to which the FDA is, is not watching over what goes into our food in terms of food additives We're very gonna, closely. I was very, 
We're going to talk yeah, soy please. products in part two. Uh, Melanie Warner, longtime journalist covering the food industry. Her new book is called Pandora's Lunchbox, How Processed Food Took Over the American Meal. Wang Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.